Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 91 a spoonful of sugar with your macaron. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my caring and nurturing co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetheart? Tired. How are you? Um, frustrated, <laughs> exhausted. Um, hopefully, I attended to all of the technical difficulties, mm-hmm. screaming and shouting and cursing beforehand. Yep. You did all of that. Hopefully, we will have a smooth <laughs> podcast this week unlike last week (laughs) we'll see (laughs) it's still early (laughs) so on today's episode in our disney detective we're going to talk about another merger for disney which is kind of a logical one at this point Mm -hmm. Uh, then we'll talk about um how one of the sons of the sherman brothers uh, prompted an iconic song characteristic of disney and our tales from the edge of the galaxy uh, John Favreau reveals new details about Baby Yoda's macarons, the little, are they blue? He was eating green. Green, green I think. Green, green blue, yeah. whatever. Uh, we'll also talk about the real reason George Lucas sold Star Wars. We do have some Mando moments mm-hmm. to talk about. And in our entertainment news, we will talk about Warner Brothers and uh, how they're planning on releasing their movies moving forward, which is rather revolutionary and then elliot page will continue to star in umbrella academy netflix will be changing credits on his past films uh then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and we do have uh, an afterthought mm-hmm. tribute to uh, to talk about at the end of the show before we get into things here i would encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast uh, you can subscribe to the video version of the podcast, uh, looking for insights into things. The audio versions of the podcast are listed as insights into entertainment. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and Pandora. We would also encourage folks to reach out and give us some feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. Uh, we are on uh, it's not on here. Where'd it go? Instagram. On Instagram, we're at Insights Into Things. And on Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash Insights Into Things podcast. Or you can get links to all those from our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Sure. All right. <laughs> For Disney Detective with our new sounds. Uh, so this article uh, came from comicbook.com and it was actually uh, they were uh, sourcing um, Collier, I guess, um, that they were claiming that it looked like Disney was looking to finally merge with Hulu into one encompassing platform so disney had been wanting to pl- uh to launch disney plus for for years and with the studio purchasing the majority of 20th century fox assets last year they've been talking about kind of bringing everything in under one umbrella so currently disney plus has roughly about 73 million subscribers while hulu has roughly about 36 million so finding a way to kind of do one format for a hu- 110 million subscribers would surely give the streaming platform more, you know, firepower uh, to make important deals. But the biggest issue uh, that 
you know, most people are concerned about is the fact that on Disney Plus, everything is pretty family friendly. Uh, even their PG-13 stuff is along the lines of, you know, the MCU. So it's not too over the top, where obviously Hulu has a lot more R-rated stuff and TVMA stuff. So the concern is, how do you merge everything and keep it still family friendly for those that want it and keep, you know, the younger kids away from the more questionable content? Um, so all of, both of the services are actually owned by Disney, so it's really not a merger, so to speak. It's just kind of merging two different, uh, you know, streaming services in into one. So, um, you know, I guess we'll we'll see what what ends up happening. Um, you know, they were talking about possibly maybe uh, password protecting. You know, to to that when you log in, you have to you know log in with a password because right now you have to log in with a profile, but it's not protected. So I could log in as you or you could log in as, as me. So obviously they need to do some tweaking before it, you know, moves forward. But it's been out there. A couple of different news sources were talking about it. So obviously it's and this doesn't really in the as, works. <clears throat> come as much of a surprise because after uh, Disney picked up the 20th Century mm -hmm. Fox properties, they took a majority stake in Hulu. Right. The unfortunate thing is here is that Hulu itself was more of a consumer-friendly clearinghouse of networks. Mm -hmm. And with Disney taking the majority stake in there, it kind of negates the whole purpose of it. Mm -hmm. And it, ultimately, in the end, it's going to be the users who are going to get hurt from this because, you know, as anytime anything gets gobbled up and you have less competition, right. there's less incentive to keep the prices reasonable. Mm -hmm. So what you'll see probably happen is you'll see Disney merge this in probably in a parental controlled area right. of Disney Plus, and you're going to see those prices go up because they're not going to give you Hulu and Disney Plus at the same price. Right. And right now there's a lot of deals. Like, for instance, we get Hulu for free because mm -hmm. of our cellular carrier. Right. And you're going to see all those deals are going to evaporate and mm -hmm. you're going to have to pay for it moving forward. Right. So... It's not unexpected, but I don't think it's going to turn out well for the end users in mm. this case. Tell us about Spoonful of Sugar. So uh, this is actually a story that that he has shared many times. Uh, I happen to be friends on Facebook uh, with Jeffrey Sherman. Um, he happens to be the son of uh, Bob Sherman, who is part of uh, half of the writing team of the Sherman brothers, who um, Robert and Richard, who were also known as Dick and Bob, where they pen many of the classics heard in Mary Poppins, The Jungle Book, Aristocats, and more. Uh, Disney theme park fans will recognize One Little Spark, It's a Small World, and There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, and the Tiki Room song. So those were all penned. So, so if you've been to Disney or watched any Disney movies, you've heard a Sherman Brothers song. Um, but what you might not know is that his uh, Bob's son, Jeffrey, is the reason that the song Spoonful of Sugar was written. And what's kind of cool is, again, he's shared the story uh, a number of times on on Facebook about how, uh, you know, he he kind of helped, uh, you know, with with this song. And he just posted about it um, a couple of days ago. And now it's just kind of blown up and gone viral. Uh, before we started filming, I was actually looking and he just posted. Um, so this article uh, came from uh, inside the inside the magic uh, dot net. But it was actually also featured on Today.com. So the Today Show did a little blurb on it, too. So it's it's kind of blown up, um, you know, just in the last couple of days. So he explains, you know, the story. So his his dad and his uncle are, are writing the various songs for Mary Poppins. And <clears throat> there's this one song that they both love. And um, Julie Andrews you know, is they're in the middle of 
you know, kind of filming some of the stuff. And she says, you know, and she tells Walt Disney, you know, I really don't like this, this one song. Everything else kind of flows. This one song I don't like. And it just so happened that it was a song that the, the two brothers really liked. So they're like, all right, we need to come up with another song. And they couldn't think of anything. And this was, and he says that, you know, when I was a kid, they were rolling out the vaccine for polio and we were given, uh, we were given it at school and they put it on a sugar cube. So when he had gone home, uh, that day from school, his dad was there and he had had a rough day and he said, Oh, you know, how was, how was your day at school? And he's like, Oh, I, I got my polio vaccine. And he was like, wait a second, but you hate shots. So, you know, part of the, the story, he explains that he, he, you know, hated shots and he would like run and hide from the nurses. So, of course, his dad was kind of shocked. How did you get the vaccine? And they were like, oh, they just put it with some sugar and we just had to eat it. And he just went, oh, hold on, I got to call your uncle. And that's how they came up with the spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So it was, again, he shared the story, you know, a couple times throughout the years. But obviously in, you know, now with all the different vaccine informations, you know, coming out and, and whatnot, he was, you know, basically saying, hey, if you can do something, take it with some sugar. We're all in this one small world together. We need to be safe for everybody. And, you know, gave a little story how his experience kind of paved the way to this iconic uh, song from Mary Poppins. So That's, that's kind of cute. And, yeah. and, you know, this is the time that we need stuff like that. Some, mm -hmm. some throwbacks to a, a simpler, more innocent era. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and the reassurance that, you know, we've we've kind of gone through this sort of thing before right, and, right. and we've gotten through it and we're going to get through it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, let's let's do it all as a team, folks. We're all on the same team here. And, yeah. you know, we'll get through it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a cute story. Yeah. So, again, it was it was really cool that, you know, again, like I said, because I've been friends with him on Facebook for years, I've heard the story before, so sure. it wasn't. But now to hear how all of a sudden it kind of picked up momentum, you know, was, nice. was kind of cool. That was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Starforge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Go. Just go do something. <laughs> so, Star Wars The Mandalorian has been breaking the internet on a almost weekly basis between the live-action introductions of major characters and the, the countless connections and, and pieces of lore. And obviously, along the way, there's the those lovable moments uh, with Grogu or Baby Yoda or the child, whatever you, you know, still want to call him. Um, and obviously, one of the, you know, more adorable instances happened in the 12th episode that was called The Heist, where we saw Baby Yoda stealing and eating, and then, of course, throwing up a package of macarons uh, from another child. Um, and obviously, that had, 
uh, fans, you know, smitten uh, after that. Um, and so what was kind of funny was there was a video that was posted on a popular YouTube channel uh, where it was actually uh, John Favreau was with a chef and they were making macarons. Um and he was kind of giving, you know, little behind the scenes uh, stories a- about the episode. Uh, and he had said, Josh, uh, their prop master came to us and was asking, what do these cookies look like? So he, John had said, well, if you look at the very end of the episode under the credits, they always like to include the production art. Um, and that's been something that we've always enjoyed watching after each episode. Um, so he said... You know, when they were first looking at them, they weren't really sure. And then he was like, well, I kind of want them to be blue, like it was made from from blue milk. So something kind of weird and and unusual. And that's when he kind of started baking macarons and, you know, not the full macaron, but just kind of part of it, because I guess it's usually made like a sandwich. So they just made part of it. Um, And (laughs) Favreau then, you know, basically uh, says that he apologized saying that, you know, for this elaborate cookie, because so many um, fans, when they see something, uh, you know, the the kids want to either eat that or make something and macarons happen to be kind of expenses because it's it's made with almond powder and and stuff um so uh you know so then they were gonna try and go with like a cheaper cookie but then you know it just didn't work so they had to you know go with a more uh expensive one uh and he said obviously you know the one that they made really didn't have any flavor but nobody was gonna be (laughs) but it needed to look you know really good um you know and then they talked about um you know the rest of the episode and obviously we know that carl weathers was the one that directed that one um and when he had read the script he actually went to john and said you need to put more baby in there you know so he's a big fan of baby so that's why we got you know with everything else that was going on in that episode we got you know a lot of baby yoda funny parts with him you know when when they're uh, racing away woo you know, and things like that. So, um, you know, so it, it was a cute little story. And, you know, so if you want to learn how to make some macarons, not macaroons, because macaroons are made with coconut and macarons are made with almonds. Aha. Aha. See, so there is a key difference. There, there. is. Well, and this sort of uh, goes in line with the, I don't know, trend that Disney has, has had mm-hmm. uh, since quarantine where they've been giving out. The, yes, uh, true. Recipes for the various mm-hmm. park things and different things like that. So now you have a uh, a Star Wars, yeah. I don't know, dessert delight sure. recipe. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, they said they don't have any taste, so I guess they don't taste bad then. Right. Well, or maybe the ones that they made. You, you know, right. like if you make the real recipe, maybe they give you the recipe that make them taste good. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. So. So what is the real reason that George Lucas sold Star Wars? It wasn't just the money? It wasn't just the money, wasn't actually. Just the money. Although that was a very good reason. He, he made a whole lot of money. So obviously George Lucas made history when he sold the Star Wars brand and the rest of Lucasfilm to the Walt Disney Company in 2012. The landmark sale gave Disney the rights to the most popular and influential piece of fiction of the last century, and many people speculated exactly why he decided to sell off his most profitable venture, and now it seems some answers have come to light. Uh, So this article came from giantfreakingrobot.com. That's such a cool... (laughs) That's J.J. Abrams. (laughs) Is it? Yeah, it's his production company. Oh, okay. Makes sense then. Um, so in the new Star Wars archives book that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, too, it seems that George had revealed that his real motivation be- behind the sale of Lucasfilms and Star Wars was his family. He said, I was 69. Um, and so the question was, am I going to keep doing this for the rest of my life? Do I want to go through this again? And finally, I decided I'd rather raise my daughter and enjoy life for a while. So George was actually planning to begin work on another Star Wars trilogy that would have taken place after the events of Star Wars, um, 
Episode six, Return of the Jedi. So according to Lucas, the way he made the Star Wars films would it have would have taken an entire decade. He says it takes 10 years to make a trilogy. Episodes one through three uh, went from 1995 to 2005. He had uh, so he said when he was planning to start, it would have been 2012 and he just didn't want to be making movies for for that long is really kind of you know what it came down to he said i've been you know spent my life creating star wars for 40 years and i'm giving it up uh he said giving it up was very very painful but it was the right thing to do um he said while he shared his original ideas obviously for the next trilogy with disney obviously we know disney kind of said nope we're doing our our own thing um, so now George is actually more focused on his film legacy and preservation, and that includes helping to build a museum, uh, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, and making sure that future generations understand the power and legacy of the art. So maybe one day we'll get to see what his vision of Star Wars, the next trilogy, you know, was supposed to be. Maybe it'll be, you know, an exhibit in in the museum. You never know. It's hard to believe that he's interested in preserving the legacy of his films after he butchered them <laughs> with the, uh, you know, the remake of the original trilogy. But we know why he did that because we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Because of course that was it in this book make too. It right? I, know, I mean, but he, it's his he movie. Makes, he can do whatever. No, it's not. It's not. It stopped being his movie when he released it. Okay? okay, you release it. It goes out to the public. It was put in the Library of Congress. You have no right to go in there and touch up the Mona Lisa after you've you've finished the work. But how do you know he didn't? He didn't what? Go back and fix the Mona Lisa. Pretty sure he didn't. How do you know? Were you there? He was dead. <laughs> That's kind of terminal at that point, right? But you don't know. Yeah. He might have had like five versions of the Once Mona Lisa. He, he's commissioned to do a work. He does the work. He hands it off. He doesn't modify Whatever. it. Anyway. Whatever. Whatever. So, uh, okay, so it wasn't the money. Right, okay. <laughs> we all believe that, right? <laughs> so, a uh, couple minutes. Uh, just I want to dedicate a couple minutes to our Mando moments. Uh, so, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. This is all if you our spoilers. haven't watched this week's episode, don't listen. Right, don't listen. Put your fingers in your ear. La, 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 or we'll fast sum it forward. Up for you. We'll save you a good 20 minutes of the show if you want. <laughs> Stop. It was an awesome episode. Uh, what do I got? One, two, three, four, five, six things today. Oh, wow. So, Dark Troopers. I was right. That's all I had to say about those. Okay. Boba's back. Yes. Not only is Boba back, he still got Slave One after all these years, which is more than uh, the Mando can say after this episode. <laughs> um, episodes. Django is officially Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Put the rest, all this. He was a, he was a Mandalorian in, in legacy, non-canon. Uh, then in canon, he was accused really of, by a corrupt politician of being just a thug, but now he is a Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that was huge. And now he's on the team. Yep. So apparently uh, we're building uh, Jin's Eleven because he's not Ocean. <laughs> right, so, right. Uh, Din, well, Din, Din Jaren, sorry, Din's right. Eleven, Din's Eleven. Right, sure. Um, uh, the Beskar Spear survives. And more importantly, the Gear Shift Ball survives. That was so sad, too. So that's, so his, his ship gets blown up and there's literally nothing. It's basically... You know, dust at this right, point. Right, right, right. And he's sifting through and he finds the ball, which plays a huge role. In, you know, another bonding moment in the beginning mm -hmm. here. His little father son bonding moment. But the spear, the Beskar spear that he got in the last episode, mm -hmm. that survives, which clearly sets up A, a reunion with Baby Yoda, who is, uh, was invited to stay with the Imperials for a little while as their guest. Right. Um, and uh, a showdown probably with uh, Moff Gideon and the Dark Saber. Mm -hmm. He's going to fight him with the spear. Yeah. I'd take the Dark Saber over the spear any day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, so Dark Side Baby Yoda. 
He was totally dark side after he was invited to stay. He's force choking people. He's throwing them around. It was awesome. Uh, he's not afraid to use the force at this point in time. Right. Uh, he's overcome his whatever inhibitions he had. However, he does have to take a nap he afterwards. Has to take a nap, poor little thing. Um. So <laughs> he's not all that powerful just yet. Right. He does seem to recognize the dark saber or at least a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. So he, he goes to reach for that and he's familiar with those from his training apparently. Right. And then the overriding question is who did he contact when he was meditating on the stone? Luke. Who's left? You got Luke. Luke. You got Leia. Mm -hmm. Possibly Cal Kestis, Possibly Ezra Bridger. Mm -hmm. So who's going to show up? Right. And right. They're, they're the good guys. Right. What bad guys are out there. Right, right. Because the way this show's going, you're going to get to the bad guys before you get to the good guys. <laughs> Probably, unfortunately. Uh, the Razor Crest. Yeah, not so much. Poof. <laughs> totally yeah. gone. The shame after he, you know, it, it, he beat it up, got yeah. it back, rebuilt the whole thing, and now it's gone. Got hit by an orbital bombardment from uh, the cruiser. Yeah. Um, which is ironic because stormtroopers in this episode are five feet away from someone who can't shoot them, but somehow they can hit a speck of dust from orbit with yeah. the cruiser. Um, so interesting. Uh, the other thing I noticed in that scene was that Boba Fett flew really close to the cruiser and nobody shot at him. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Which makes me wonder if there's a reason for that. Mm. Cause I don't think slave one is all that stealthy. Right. Right. So maybe there's a fix in there. Mm. Don't know. Uh, and the last thing is Ocean's Eleven. So apparently we're building the A-team here once <laughs> again, which we did last season with different people. Right, right. So we have uh, Mando. We have Boba Fett. We have whatever Ming-Na Wei's character is. I can never remember her right. name. Uh, now we're going to go break somebody out of prison. Right. We're probably going to get Cara Dune to help us. At least not break them out because now she's the law. Right, right. So she'll probably help in, in the finale there. Right. And maybe when we break what's his name out of jail, we'll bring a couple of his friends too. Right. Because that'll kind of be like, oh, well, so if you take me, you got to take we him. Need a, we need a, what do we have? Two episodes left this season? I think so. Yeah. So we got a jailbreak episode and then the finale. It's, I mean, I suspect we're probably going to see Bo-Katan come back for the finale. I don't know if we're going to see Ahsoka come back. Would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But I think they're setting, she appeared, I think, more to set up her own her own show. Right. So I don't think we're going to see her back this season. She might be back next season. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's that was my Mando moments for this week, my takeaways for this week. Uh, we'll be back in a minute with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So this was some sh kind of shocking news, but not really uh, <laughs> that came out uh, this week. So Warner Brothers had come out last week uh, and we talked about it, how they were going to be releasing Wonder Woman um, on HBO Max the same time that they were releasing it to the theaters and leaving it on HBO Max for just the month. Well, now it seems uh, Warner Brothers is releasing all of their 2021 movies 
to HBO Max and to theater. So they're going to be doing the same thing that they're doing with Wonder Woman that they're going to be doing with all um, of their, I believe, how many movies was it? 12, 17, 17 movies for next year. So everything will be going to theaters. So if you happen to live in an area where your theaters are still open, you are more than welcome to obviously go and enjoy the movie at the theater, or you can start subscribing to (laughs) HBO Max, and for a one-month period, the movie will be streaming on HBO Max as well. Um, And this was kind of something that we've been talking about for for a while now with, you know, what are the movie studios going to be doing? Um, You know, they've had so many months to kind of figure something out and, you know... they've been going back and forth so many different times. You know, Disney did it as well. Are we going to release it on Disney Plus? Are we going to, you know, hold off and wait, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, we're going to release it, but now it's at a premium. But then they release certain things that aren't at a premium. So they kind of, you know, been teetering back and forth. And now Warner Brothers finally said, you know what, this is how we're doing it for for 2021 um so it's various movies it's uh suicide squad the matrix 4 dune uh godzilla vs king kong space jam a new legacy uh other films are uh the little things um tom and jerry i didn't even know they were doing that (laughs) uh mortal Kombat, those who wish me dead uh the conjuring in the heights um and uh whole you know a, a bunch of others uh as well so it's you know a a big lineup you know kind of different genres of, of film um as well um the uh Toby uh Emrich who is the Warner Brothers picture chairman uh was quoted in the article uh that came from the Hollywood Reporter basically saying you know it allows us to do a global release and a national a national release and what we think is going to be a checkerboard uh theatrical market place for the bulk of 2021 we think that theaters you know some theaters are going to go and open so consumers can go and there were a lot of people that are going to choose to to stay home as well so it's nice to see that you know they're kind of making it you know available for for whichever market you kind of fall into well and and again this is not unexpected Mm -mm. We've been talking about this for months now that they need to figure out a way mm-hmm. to distribute their product and still make money off of mm-hmm. it. What I thought was interesting was as soon as this announcement came out, right? Uh, movie chains AMC and Cinemark had a 15% drop in their stock. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is going to hurt the movie theater. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, if if the studios find that this is profitable and and to an agreeable extent, this may be the future of movie mm-hmm. releases. Mm-hmm. Um, direct to market here, you can make money off of it for sure. Oh, absolutely! And you're not paying licensing, you know, fees or marketing or anything like that. So there's definitely advantages of it to the studios, but I think it's going to fundamentally break the the movie theater system that mm-hmm. we have now because there are movies that really should be seen in the theater. Absolutely. They're designed for it. And mm-hmm. I think movies like the matrix, mm-hmm. you, know, you mentioned matrix is coming out. Right. I think movies like that, star Wars, I mean, you, you cannot not see star Wars in a theater. Right. Right. It, it's just, it's made for it. Mm-hmm. You know, we can sit at home with, a 65 inch 4K TV and and 7.1 Dolby surround sound. What are you trying to say? Blast it and get <laughs> right. a fantastic effect, but it's not the movie. But it's theater. not the same, right? So we'll see. I, I I certainly hope that this move doesn't put the movie theaters out of business. Mm-hmm. But I hope it's a way for people to still consume the the product out there under mm-hmm. very difficult circumstances. Yeah. So tell us about Elliot Page. So Elliot Page will continue to play the role of Vanya Hardgraves in The Umbrella Academy. And Netflix 
uh, is uh, it's a Netflix series. It's actually been one of my insightful picks. And it's a family of superheroes um, that has become one of the streaming service's biggest hits. Vanya happens to be a cisgender woman whose superpower involves unleashing force through the use of sound. Uh, so as of right now, there are no plans to change the character's gender. So if you're not familiar, um, the actor was uh had uh made an announcement earlier this week um that he is a gender non-binary transgendered person um and had posted on his social media about it um now he happens to be the star of the breakout film juno also part of the x-men series um and also part of the umbrella academy so as of uh tuesday the umbrella academy's imdb page has actually already updated their information uh they took out her dead name which was ellen if you didn't know and changed it to elliot um so now netflix is in the process of el- updating all of the movies that he was in to include Elliot now. So if you wanted to search by actor, you'd be able to find all of his movies. Um, obviously, he made the announcement and basically, you know, he had said, I have to do, you know, what's right for me. And this is who I am. I know there are some people that aren't as fortunate to be able to come out and say who they really are. I hope you can understand um, that I'm doing this because I need to. And he was obviously met with, you know, so much love, um, and, and support from, from, you know, from various people. Um, so, you know, then, uh, you know, there were a couple of people, um, that were saying, oh, well, maybe they need to recast, you know, and and not have a transgendered person in this role because the character isn't transgendered. And uh, Glad actually had came out and said, trans actors can and do play both trans and cisgender characters. And I'm sure Elliot will continue to be brilliant in it the Umbrella Academy and many other types of roles in his future. Um, and the Umbrella Academy, again, centers on a group of adopted siblings of superheroes who uh, team up to solve the mystery of their father's death while warding off poten- the uh, potential uh, apocalypse. Uh, the series just had its second season that came out this past summer. And in November, Netflix actually renewed it for a third season as well. That's interesting, and I, and I think it's it's fantastic to see the kind of support that came mm-hmm. forward, you know, for this decision here. And I think it's, I think it's monumental given where we were. You look twenty years ago, mm-hmm. yeah, and and how how far the equality movement has mm-hmm. come in that time. It, it's got a ways to go. It still has a yeah. I was just gonna say it still has it's, a way to it's go. Got a ways to go, but the amount of progress that's been made in the last twenty years mm-hmm. has is encouraging Mm -hmm. just to say the least. And, you know, and we were even talking about what, maybe even a year ago about the whole dead name and, you know, and, and Netflix and IMDB, you know, they were trying to go through and, and update various actors who had come forward and saying, this is my dead name, please don't use it anymore. And now it's, you know, he came out with the comment and there was no question about it. Netflix is updating IMDB. And there shouldn't be. I mean, the, the right, fact exactly. that, that you have a forward thinking organization mm-hmm. like that, that will, right. that will without question take care of that for you. I think mm-hmm. that's fantastic. Yeah. And that's supportive of, of those who have not found the opportunity to come mm-hmm. forward at this point in time, who, mm-hmm. who are still, you know, may still be operating under duress. Mm hmm. I'll say, you know, yeah. whether it's their family or the press or, or mm-hmm. whoever, you know, every time you see an example of this where this, you know, someone has an extraordinary amount of courage to mm-hmm. come forward mm-hmm. and they're rewarded for that, I think is a fantastic thing. Yeah. So that was all we had for our entertainment news this week. We'll mm-hmm. be back uh, real quick with our insightful picks of the week. Joe, 
Ooh, for your insightful pick. I don't have any clever music. Oh, okay. I was waiting for something. Uh... Yeah, I don't have like, you know, picking music or something like that or thinking <laughs> or, you know. Well, okay. I'll see what I can come up with for next sure, week. Sure. There you go. So my insightful pick uh, for this week happens to be a show that we both started watching together when it came out. Um, and we actually just finished season one. And it is The Walking Dead World Beyond. Um so the series is set in Nebraska 10 years after the zombie apocalypse has started, and it features four teenage protagonists and focuses on the first generation to come of age in the apocalypse as we know it. And some will become heroes, some will become villains, and in the end, all of them will be changed forever. Um, and... Um, you know, so you see this heroic group of teens kind of sheltered from, you know, from the dangers of, of everything, and they decide to leave their little safety haven, um, to kind of go on a cross country journey, uh, to find one of, uh, the fathers of two of the girls, uh, to kind of save the world. Um, it happens to be a spinoff series of The Walking Dead. It's actually the third, uh, spinoff from the walking dead. Um, and, uh, when they had announced that they were going to be doing this, it was only going, they know that they're only doing two seasons of it. So it's one of those, we know what our beginning is. We know what our, our end is, which I kind of like because sometimes you start watching a show and they're getting into it. And then all of a sudden, Oh, we're canceled or, Oh, we're not doing it anymore. And they never finally get to that, ending where with this we know it's just two seasons uh 10 episodes each so you know a, there's gonna be the beginning middle and end and you know we were kind of not really sure it's it's kind of i guess sort of not really a kid's version of walking dead maybe a teenage version of it because obviously the, the zombies with angst <laughs> You know, they really don't know how to fight very well. They kind of push them out. A lot of cross-checking involved. They, yeah, they must have been they, hockey fans. <laughs> right. But it's interesting to see because they give you these, like, little hints of things that you're like, hmm, what, what's this little twist and what's this little turn? And there were some uh, articles that were talking about, okay, is Rick going to show up in the second season because you kind of – figure out that the people that took him away when uh, he had gotten hurt are the same military kind of organization that are in this. So you're finding out a little bit more about them. So it'll be interesting to see where they weave uh, everything uh, together. So I think we both enjoyed it. It, it. You know, you didn't give up on it because there were a couple of weeks where you're like, all right, this kind of needs to change. But all in all, you liked it, and I know I enjoyed it. So, looking forward to to whenever you know the second uh, season will come out. All right, good pick. Thank you. So, my pick this week is another space documentary because I haven't had enough of those. Right? Might as well keep a theme going, right? Uh, well, I like I like watching them and seeing how they're different. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this week's. Uh, documentary was Apollo Chronicles on Amazon Prime. Featuring rare archival footage and audio, this epic four-part miniseries documents one of the greatest accomplishments of the 20th century. But behind this seminal event is a moment monumental story filled with incredible drama, danger, ingenuity, and emotion. The Apollo Chronicles tells the story like it has never been told before. Participants, family members, historians, and other experts paint a rich portrait of a story that will have the audience immersed from start to finish. And right in the first episode, within the first few minutes of the first episode, I learned something about the Apollo program that I had never known. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to say it here. Okay. Because people sort of need to watch it. But it was a very surprising anecdote that came out of that. And and that seems to happen at least once in every episode of these four episodes. Uh, so there's information that's in there that's presented differently than other documentaries, but there's information that's deeper than other documentaries. And I found it 
kind of a refreshing change from some of the standard boring stock footage stuff mm-hmm. that you see. They talk about something that's actually going to be featured in our Insights in the History podcast that we're working on. So that was kind of interesting to see as well. So it was it was kind of, you know, different footage that was in there, a little behind the scenes stuff. They talked to some industry experts, they talked to the uh um head astronomer at the Franklin Institute, which was oh, interesting. Okay. So that kind of a little you local know, tie. Little, little home tie there. And they talked to a number of other experts from the area, but you found out information from that you didn't know about the uh, Soviet space program too. So it was very interesting how they how they pulled all these different little <laughs> tidbits together and um, gave you more of an insight than you would normally have seen in in other episodes. So Apollo Chronicles streaming now on Amazon Prime. So the last thing that we did have today, uh, unfortunately, this news broke almost immediately Sunday. after. Sunday, it was. Yeah, it was immediately after the show last week, and that is the death of David Prowse. Now, for those of you who are not diehard Star Wars fans, David Prowse was the man in the suit in the original Star Wars trilogy. Everyone knows that James Earl Jones did the voice. Uh, and he did the voice because David Prowse is British and he has a very distinctive British accent. And when Lucas was filming the movie, he would have David Prowse do the lines and they'd go back and they'd look at the screen trials afterwards and realize that that voice was not going to fit that character. However, he was picked to do, to be the character. Because he was an imposing individual. He was a a professional bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, he was very good friends, lifelong friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. They would work out together. Um, He was an actor who did, uh, worked in Hammer Films, worked with Hammer Films. So he was familiar with Peter Cushing, with Christopher Lee, other, you know, standout Star Wars characters. He's played Frankenstein. He's play, He's been on Doctor Who. So he had quite a uh, repertoire before he came to Star Wars. But where he really was the, the most famous, because you got to see his face, was um, outside of being a, a weightlifter, he was the Green Cross Code Man, who was a uh, road safety individual, um, almost like a Smokey the Bear kind of mm-hmm figure over here he was that over there for for road safety and and kids grew up knowing him as this individual to the point that he was actually made a member of the british order empire forget i I wrote it down i don't remember what it was and and that's that's what he wanted to be most known for Mm -hmm. although he was always vader the rest of his life right um and i had an opportunity a missed opportunity to meet him. I know. And I'm not the type of person who gets excited about getting celebrities pictures or photograph mm-hmm. or, or autographs or anything like that. Yeah. So I never bothered with that before, but, but David Prowse was the only person I ever wanted to do that with. And mm-hmm. he was appearing at a, it was Monster Mania. It was Monster Mania in Cherry Hill on New Jersey a few years back. Mm-hmm. I was psyched. I wanted to go. I was going to pay whatever it cost to go and mm-hmm. meet him, shake his hand, get a picture, and get him to sign it. Yep. And I wound up getting, like, deathly ill that weekend, mm-hmm. and I could not go. I did sneak a picture of him. I, I didn't go and meet him, but right. that was kind of before they started getting more uh territorial about sure, taking sure. pictures so you know so from standing across the way with my cell phone yeah. I, I did take a picture but i know it wasn't the same so i missed the opportunity shortly after that you know he was in advanced age there and he stopped doing public appearances mm-hmm. after that so i knew i'd never get it again 
And then it was kind of heartbreaking seeing the news on Sunday of last week that he had passed away. But uh, he was 85 years old. David Prowls, the original Darth Vader, sadly is no longer with us. And that was it for the show this week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we go, I would invite folks to, uh, I'm not even going to push the medium articles at this point. I'm so embarrassed. They're so classic. Uh, I'm waiting. They're for from the, like five years ago, but I'm really, they're not. I'm waiting for the. I'm waiting for us to drop the history ones because I'll just have like 15 that I can post right up because they're all written perfect for that format. Right, right. So I'll push it then. Sure. In the meantime, uh, you can subscribe to our podcast. Our video podcast are listed as insights into things. Our audio is listed as insights into entertainment. They can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn. Um, and a bunch of others I don't have written down. Um, we would invite you to reach out and give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com or find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are a Amazon prime member, you get a free Twitch prime subscription that you can throw our way uh, monthly, which helps us out tremendously. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are insights into things. The audio version of all of our podcasts are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. On (laughs) YouTube, you can catch uh, high res versions of our videos on youtube.com slash insights into things. Or all of our information for all of our links and everything are on our main website, insightsintothings.com. And I think that's it. That's it. Another one in the book. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.